Yeah, I'm Larry Tribe. I guess my official name is Lawrence H. Tribe, and I'm the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard Law School and Professor of Constitutional Law. Well, the Roberts Court is deeply divided, as is the country, on the subject of race. And we talk in the book about how four members of the court seem to think that our difficult racial history is behind us, and that, as the Chief Justice put it, all we need to do in order to get past the problems of race uh, is to stop making race a big deal. We have to stop using race as a basis of any government action. Famously, he said, the one way to stop discrimination based on race is to stop discriminating based on race. Other members of the court are deeply convinced, every bit as deeply, that we're not anywhere near the goal yet, that there's still a lot of hidden and unconscious race prejudice, that we have miles to go before we sleep. The justices who tend to believe that we are almost there have been on the ascendant. And most recently, and I think most unfortunately, in a case from Selma, Alabama, when the court invalidated the provision of the extraordinarily important Voting Rights Act of 1965 that required jurisdictions that had previously been adjudicated guilty of severe race discrimination in voting to submit their proposed changes in voting schemes to the government for approval, when that was ripped apart by the court, it left the law of racial equality in a, a, in a very difficult state. I mean, Justice Ginsburg, I think, was right when she said that for the majority to say we have achieved so much that we don't have to continue doing it is like saying this umbrella has kept me dry in a storm, so I can now get rid of it and toss it away. But on many other issues dealing with race, the division is not yet resolved, partly because Justice Kennedy, very much in the middle, is unwilling to go either all the way with the Chief Justice and some on his side on this issue by saying we have to just disregard race, nor is he willing to go with Breyer and Sotomayor and and, and Kagan and the more liberal members of the court in saying that when race is used in a benign way to integrate rather than to segregate, it should not be so strictly supervised by the Supreme Court. Affirmative action, that is, attempts to integrate rather than segregate in race-specific ways is teetering. It's not dead. It's not exactly alive. It's on life support. And in the book, we talk about why the decisions have come out the way they have, <clears throat> have and, what, and what the future seems likely to hold. I think the one area where the court has really spurred and been party to a major cultural and social revolution in legal understanding is with respect to gay rights. One of the cases that I argued and lost in 1986, a case about whether the government can punish people for having oral or anal sex, um, particularly if they are of the same sex, but the, uh, the law that the court upheld in that case, in Bowers v. Hardwick, drew no distinction. It said oral and anal sex between consenting adults in private is illegal. When I took that case, I was pretty clear that I wouldn't win, but I wanted to generate dissents that would become the future, because I thought it was clear that laws of this kind, even though they were technically about anatomy and not about sexual orientation, in fact were the way that people used to marginalize lesbians, gays, and bisexuals because they could easily say, well, look, the only way they can satisfy their physical cravings is by having oral or anal sex, and that's a crime, therefore they're criminals, therefore it's okay to exclude them from various public benefits, it's okay to deny them the right to adopt kids. It was symbolic and it was central 
to the second class citizenship of some of our own closest relatives and friends. And when that dissent became essentially the majority opinion in a case in 2003 called Lawrence v. Texas, when I was in the court as counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union and Justice Kennedy delivered the opinion, it was a glorious moment. It was a glorious moment because the court said that Bowers v. Hardwick had been wrong from the very day it was decided. And it was not enough to simply strike down these laws when they drew distinctions between same-sex and opposite-sex intimacy. You had to get rid of them entirely in order to avoid the symbolic indignity to the LGBT community. In that decision and in another one striking down a Colorado constitutional amendment that made gays second-class citizens in another way, the Supreme Court made enormous strides analogous to those that it had made in the 1950s with respect to race culminating in Brown v. Board of Education. Probably the most important of those decisions to date uh, is the decision striking down the most important part of the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, in that case, Justice Kennedy, joined by the four often described as liberal justices, struck down the provision of federal law that said even if you're legally married in a state, and right now there are, I guess, 19 states that either by the, the state's own laws or by judicial decision will allow same-sex people to marry. Even if you're legally married under the laws of California or New York or Massachusetts, as far as the federal government is concerned, if you're not a man and a woman, you can't be married, and there are about a 1,000 benefits that you will be denied. When the Supreme Court struck that down, not only because it wasn't part of the federal government's business to second-guess states in that way when they expand rights, be a different question whether you can appropriately overturn the states when they constrict rights. Not only was it an excess of federal power, it was an indignity and a denial of liberty and equality to same-sex couples. To tell couples that they can't be married even though they are the same as other couples in the same state and that their kids can't say that my mom and dad are married and that their kids can be ostracized is a fundamental indignity, and it's only a matter of time until the Supreme Court says so. And we suggest in the chapter that the court has left a path of exit. It hasn't absolutely committed itself to that result. But now that state after state has had a federal court ruling and some state court rulings saying that the ultimate meaning of equality and liberty and dignity in our constitutional system is that people, regardless of their sex, should be able to marry whom they love, I think it's really quite clear that the Supreme Court will move in the same direction.